Hi, this is Jonathan Nicola with 50 Can and I'm bringing the next video in our series. And I have Executive Director of ConCan, Sabira Gordon with us, who had with her team an exciting win this year, a historic win uh, at the Capitol for kids of Connecticut. And we're bringing her to her today to talk about it. So welcome, Sabira. Hi, Jonathan. Great to see you. And, uh, you know, first, just tell us, uh, talk to us about school funding in Connecticut. You know, what's the current reality for how schools are funded in your state? So currently, Connecticut has 11 different funding formulas specifically based on school type. So depending on the type of school a student goes to, that's the kind of funding that they have. Specifically, schools of choice are funded um, directly from the state. They don't have a local contribution for charter schools. And that's a direct line item from the state budget. And uh, magnet schools are funded in a different way. Vocational tech schools are funded in a different way. And so are also vocational agricultural schools. So it's really complicated. And from a parent's perspective, it's really hard to figure out exactly how much money is coming to your student and how can you navigate the system to know what's right and what's fair. So this year we were able to do a lot of changes in the way that education is funded, specifically looking at how schools of choice charter schools are funded and um, creating a, a me mechanism for them to be funded similar to how traditional public schools are. So why is this such a big deal? What's what's the how is this going to impact Connecticut kids? So this is a really big deal because when charter schools were created, I want to say close to 20 years ago, there was a decision that they would be funded differently than other schools. And that meant that they were getting less money. And as the traditional public school system has changed how they have been funding students. So they've negotiated an education cost sharing formula that takes into account for um, English language learners and poverty and different weights that impact education funding. Charter schools were left out of that. And so were um, magnet schools and vocational agricultural schools. So this year, we decided that we really wanted to do a couple of things. One is bring all public schools into a similar system of funding. So if you are a student in a needy district, you have the same need, regardless of what kind of school that you go to. And we also wanted to take a look at why is it that education is funded in the way that it is. And really, there's a $690 million racial funding gap in Connecticut. So we wanted to make some steps to change that and ensure that we're closing that gap for racial equity and funding. And we're also ensuring that the students who need it the most, you know, English language learners who struggled were one of the subsets of students that struggled the most during COVID, like they really needed to have the extra resources to be able to catch up and recover. And essentially ensuring that we're able to help those students who, you know, may not have been served well during the pandemic. And we've been saying that for some of them, there were three or so grade levels before COVID. And right now there are probably more than that. So we want to make sure that traditional school districts and charter schools have the resources that they need to serve these kids. Wow. All right. Thanks, Sabira. So 20 years of fighting, pushing for a big win like this. So what's the difference now? Like, why is this happening now? And who to, who to thank for this, this big win? So when this work started a long time ago, um, the legislature uh, was older and wider. And you know the students who would be most impacted by this were just not, they were not represented at the legislature. And I think we've seen a big shift where a lot of younger legislators who have school age kids are really leaning into some of these conversations. Or either they don't have school age kids themselves, they have nieces and nephews, and they are navigating the education choice space themselves. And we're also seeing where you know, a lot of legislators of color are leaning into these discussions and trying to really think about how can we do best to serve our students and you know charter schools have been around for a really long time, they are really high performing schools not all of them but the majority of them outperform their school their district. And in looking at those numbers and you know they're serving kids who are from poor households they are serving English language learners. And when legislators look at those numbers they're saying well why are they funded in a different way, and you know for them looking at this you have legislators who they went through the choice system themselves and they are now legislators and they're saying this was a really good option for me. And then there's legislators themselves who are just looking at this from an equity perspective and just the pure dollars and cents and saying the ROI on this, if you're going to a school where you have a much higher likelihood of getting into a high, um, high growth, high demand career or going to college, you should be funded at least at the same way that the traditional public school is funded. And then, you know, 
organizations uh, who are in the education reform space. I think the sector has changed a lot in the last five years. I think the coalition that we built this year with Faith Acts for Education, the Charter School Association, the School and State Finance Project and Educators for Excellence was just the right coalition for the right time. We had educators saying, you know, we really believe in educational equity and funding and we will be at the Capitol fighting with you guys for this. And I think that's just changed the way we were able to advocate this year. Well, great. Love the teamwork. And you're right. When people have a personal experience, that definitely changes as a legislator how they approach something. That's that's fantastic. So what were, you know, what were some of the two or three of the best advocacy strategies you used to let a legislators know that this was important? So we had, you know, one of the great things about working in a coalition is having partners. So Faith Acts for Education has a strong network of families um, in some of our major age major urban centers, and they also have a network of pastors who were able to show up and have the real conversations about what this means for their congregation. It also, you know, was really in a virtual session, um, relationships matter. And I've been doing this work for over 10 years now, and just building strong relationships with legislators who are really willing and interested to talk about this. It was a session like no other, you everything was done over Zoom. It was all through phone calls and texts, but it was really important to stay connected. And I think when you are not in the building, it's easy to kind of step away from what's happening. So constantly ensuring that this was front of mind. And we were really talking to legislators about how important this is. And changing lives of kids is going to matter in the long run for the economic competitiveness of our state. And that was just the argument that we had. And we met with over 100 legislators in those first in the first month of the legislative session. And then we continued to meet with those legislators through the legislative session. So every time a big decision was going to be made, um, people remember we were working on Senate Bill 948, and it was that important that it needed to be talked about. So that was just, I think, the strategy that worked best in a, in a especially in a virtual legislative session. Yeah, union parties did a great job in difficult circumstances. As I heard stories around the country, it was, it was so hard to connect with lawmakers virtually. So uh, kudos to all you for that. So like a lot of big legislative wins, there's usually steps involved. You know, there's usually more to work on, more to come. So what's next in Connecticut? What else do you have to keep the pressure on to really finish out the big win around school funding in Connecticut? So one big thing that we didn't get was the magnet school funding. I think um, we have spending caps and you know, with the influx of federal dollars, I think there was a lot of things that were moving at the same time. So it was difficult to win everything. And you know, having doing legislative work for a long time, you, as you said, you don't get everything on the first try. But it's really important that we go back and have those conversations and ensure that magnet schools are a part of this equation. Magnet schools, Connecticut, I, I'm not sure if there's anywhere else in the country that has as a complicated magnet school system that we do, but there's lots of different magnet schools, lots of different types of magnet schools, and the sending, there's a tuition program between sending and hosting districts. So kind of complicated, but one of the things that we got was the legislature is tasking their Office of Fiscal Analysis to figure this out. They are putting in statute um, a budget that's going to be voted on today in the Senate that the, leg the Office of Fiscal Analysis at the legislature should figure out what it will take to get to a true student-centered funding formula. And that will challenge the legislature to really figure out, they're going to see those results and see what will it take and how much more resources do they need to invest to ensure that magnet schools can follow the same um, kind of funding that's based on need instead of uh, just a complicated system that seems, I think, to the lay person and to have no rhyme or reason. And I think as time goes on, our ECS formula has this long phase in that ends in 2028. We really want to think about how can we speed up that for speed up, speed up that phase in. So when the federal dollars go away, if there were different things that work from the federal money that districts need to use to continue to be successful, that we could figure out a way for the districts to be able to apply to the state to continue, for example, if they did intensive reading instruction, if they did high dosage tutoring, if they extended the school day, and they're seeing great results, we want to allow for districts to be able to apply for the state to continue those kind of intensive interventions. Gotcha. Well, this has been a great story. Thanks for sharing. Uh, just Really grateful for all you guys have done to help Connecticut's public school students and look forward to seeing great things from you and your coalition moving forward. Thank Thanks you, so Jonathan. Yeah.